And in which war did you serve, Jim? I served during the Vietnam era from 1968 through 1971. And which branch of the service? U.S. Army. What was your highest rank? Sergeant E-5. All right, so let's uh, start with how you got in the Army. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted uh, rather than being subject to the draft. And by the time I was ready to report for basic training, I was able to complete my master's degree as well as my bachelor's from Central Connecticut, and that opened doors that otherwise would have been closed. Do you recall the date? Uh, that would have been, uh, I would have reported for duty on 6 October 1968. Where were you living at the time you enlisted? Uh, my residence really was here at Central. I was finishing up my master's degree and living off campus here in New Britain. If you were a college student, um, you wouldn't have had a deferment? Uh, at that time, uh, deferments were like a special situation. Uh, and I had no illness or injury or any other debilitating reason I was healthy, and I chose to serve uh, rather than be drafted. So by that, I was at least able to pursue areas uh, that I knew I could use my education in, and that's how I ended up inquiring about an intelligence assignment. What was your degree in? I uh, held my bachelor's and master's in history. Why did you choose the Army? Uh, I knew about uh, Army intelligence from uh, my study of history, and so I, I felt that uh, I certainly didn't want to be aboard a ship in the Navy. Uh, Air Force, uh, I was not aware of their intelligence service, although they did have a service. So it came down to eliminating two branches and settling on the U.S. Army. Where did you go for your basic training? Basic training was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Well, can you tell me what that was like, how long, what you did? Uh, the best advice I got was from an uncle of mine who was a World War II veteran who saw combat duty in uh, uh, the war, was even a part of the Battle of the Bulge. But uh, he told me about the Army, and he, he knew also about uh, an intelligence uh, capability within the Army. So after visiting with the recruiter, regular recruiter, they uh, sent me to uh, visit with a U.S. Army intelligence recruiter, which was separate from the regular that Army. Before you were even in. That's right. And so I knew exactly what I was going to do, provided they were being honest with me, and they were. I knew before I went to basic training that once I got through with basic training, I was heading to their intelligence school. So was your basic training the same as everybody else? Yes, it was. Army? Yes. The best, the best advice I got that helped me through was, again, from my uncle, a World War II veteran, keep your mouth shut, do as you're told, don't question anything. Do you have any memorable experiences from basic training? Uh, I enjoyed going to the rifle range. I had never fired any type of weapon prior to my Army experience. And at that time, the Army's uh, weapon was the uh, M16. And I enjoyed learning how to fire that. I enjoyed going to the rifle range on a regular basis. You had to qualify. You know, you have to get so many points to be uh, efficient. In, in, the, uh, in that weapon. I made that. And like I say, I enjoyed that part of the training. And then I was very physically fit. Uh, and having been a distance runner here at Central Connecticut, um, the last part of the test that you had to pass to get out of basic training was to run a mile. And I had learned uh, that the post record was uh, five minutes and 32 seconds. So I told the drill sergeant that day of the test, 
what I was planning on doing. Please watch my time carefully. And I set a new post record running five minutes and 30 seconds in your army combat boots. Wow. <laughs> Did you go right from basic training to your uh, intelligence school, or did you get yes. away from the home first? Yes. Uh, there was a, there was a, a direct uh, shipment of us to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, where the intelligence school is located. And as soon as we signed in, uh, they gave us uh, leave, and I did not have to report back for uh, another week. So there was a slight break in between uh, my basic training and then the intelligence school. So tell me about intelligence school. How long was it? What kind of things did they teach you? What did you do? A uh, course of instruction, I believe, was 16 weeks, and that was uh, Monday through Saturday, uh, 0600 to noon every day. And the uh, training was uh, very, very specific to what my job was going to be. Uh, there was no time wasted on anything. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, that was the first time I had seen uh, classified information and learned how to treat that appropriately. Uh, we used uh, classified materials that were given to us uh, in class. And uh, all, all of our work, when we had to study for a test and that sort of thing, we would go to our classroom and open the safe and get our uh, classified notes out. So we never took any classified information, including our own personal notes that we took in class, out of that room. So you learn to appreciate uh, what classified information is, how it was obtained, uh, what it consists of, and then uh, the important thing was how to handle it. And then later on, as, a, as an actual agent, uh, there were cases that I worked on uh, that were... Uh, under special guidance and supervision because of the nature of the case. And again, some of the methods we use are, are probably just as important as some of the material we actually read. How you did your job was important, and uh, some of that still remains as a classified uh, way of doing business because it still can be effective today. Training you was your job going to be to gather intelligence, analyze intelligence, communicate it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The training was very specific uh, to what we were actually going to do, and as I look back at it, the, the training part was was very good because they trained me in an excellent manner to be able to do my job, and as a counterintelligence special agent. Uh, naturally, I learned a lot uh, at actually performing the duties, but I was well trained to do the job. Do you remember any of your instructors? Uh, one by name, I do, and I'll give you my give you his name, uh, even though uh, at that time, you know, we would not release names of any of the instructors. Some were civilian, some were military. Most, most were military. Um, we had instruction from uh, FBI personnel, CIA personnel, uh, but uh, the one that I remember most was a chief warrant officer by the name of John Connolly. He was uh, an expert in interrogation techniques, and as I say, uh, some of the things I learned from him are still valuable today in how I deal with people. But I was very well prepared. I, I, the Army School, no-nonsense approach. We, we met every morning at 0600, and we met Monday through Saturday. Sunday was our only day off. What did you do from 12 o'clock on? Uh, I usually took a nap right away. And then uh, we were told how much we should be studying. And... I probably spent an, an hour to two hours 
uh, with honest study, you know, no, no break. And then on, uh, on any test that was coming, uh, they would give you time to, to prepare for that. You knew what you were going to be tested on. If you had to use any of the classified information, we had access to that again, uh, including notes that I took that I could not keep with me. So I, I was very well prepared for the test that we took, and I graduated out of the class of uh, 50. Um, I graduated 21st out of that class, although I believe it was seven or eight who did not graduate, and they remained in the U.S. Army. What became of them, I don't know. After your graduation, where did you go? Uh, once, once we got our, uh, our orders, uh, it was set that I would be assigned to the 6th MI company, uh, which I reported to. And then I found out uh, in my first in interview there that I would choose from a choice of cities to uh, work in because the 6th MI company was originally signed, assigned to Germany. They had just come back from Germany, so we were not going to be going to Germany anytime soon. So I had a list of, I think, six or seven U.S. cities to choose from, uh, from as far west as uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, to, to as far south as Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I chose Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, because it was closest to Torrington, Connecticut. <laughs> and I don't care what anybody says, whatever your age is, no matter what your training might be, as a soldier, it's always nice to go home. Your class broke up at that point? So yes. You went as an individual That's to right. Philadelphia? Yeah. Tell me about your uh, time in Philadelphia. Is that where you spent the rest of your time? That's correct. Right up until uh, my separation from the Army, I, I did my job as a counterintelligence special agent in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, the good part about it was I could live where I wanted to. So I got an apartment in the area in which I knew I was going to be assigned to, uh, and I'll be specific with you. It was the Germantown area of Philadelphia, which was a terrific place to live at that time and to work. The people I met were, were a little bit more than you would expect, say, from a, a city like Philadelphia. But this was not the inner city. This was in the northwest part of the uh, uh, area of, of, of Pennsylvania and of Philadelphia. So I, once I got my apartment where I wanted to live, I pretty much came and went uh, according to my work schedule. There were days when I wouldn't even go into the office, although I usually did. Uh, the only time I actually had to be there was to uh, be a, a, at uh, every Monday morning we had a agent's call. It was a meeting of all the agents with our commanding officers, our supervisors. And other than that, I would come and go. A lot of times I wouldn't see uh, my fellow agents. They all had their own assignments to do. I had mine. Um, but one thing we did do it was a great team, and you know, having been an athlete prior to that, uh, there were a lot of us who were athletes too. So we we carried, I think, a lot of that uh, background. Being a soldier, we cooperated with everyone. We helped when we could. If one agent, because there were there were days when we wouldn't get new cases in, and once you learn the routine, I found that if I finished all my work as quickly as possible, there was always like a little break before I had to start up again with a new case. So in that period, uh, I would, if necessary, help other agents. And then uh, the other thing that happened, as you become more experienced, uh, you take on uh, special duties in, besides your regular work. So I had a chance to do other things uh, that normally I would not have known about. For example, I was assigned uh, to the Immigration and Naturalization Service. 
uh, something that was done then, which I don't think is being done anymore, but I found it very helpful. We had a lot of non-Americans uh, coming into the Army. So we, would, we had great cooperation from immigration and naturalization, and they would do all kinds of background checks on them and then let us know what type of individual was interested in coming into the Army. So that was, that was a way of screening people out. Um, and then uh, uh, other things I did, I worked on, I think the most significant cases were uh, espionage uh, cases in, in general. Uh, and it, it was, it was uh, even though I had a background in history and I knew about spying and that sort of thing, uh, to see that there were American citizens who were willing to betray the country was kind of shocking to me. And uh, to be able to identify an individual like that who was not doing what he was supposed to be doing and, all, and on top of it was also betraying the country by helping our enemies, uh, that, that was quite, quite a, an interesting and shocking experience to go through. And one of the cases I worked on uh, where I started from scratch, uh, but the, the, they had, I think, giving me the assignment, whoever gave me the assignment had no, knew a little bit more than I did. But by the, when I got done, uh, and, and I won't go through all the details, but I couldn't locate the individual. And one thing I did so I could tell my supervisors was I, I went to the individual's residence and every time, and I went at various times of the day. This went on for about five or six days. Did you go in uniform? We were never in uniform. I was in civilian clothes all the time as an agent. And in some cases, we dressed as uh, a soldier who had just been discharged from the army because we had our army gear. So sometimes we had to dress accordingly to blend in better. Uh, sometimes I did not wear my usual jacket and tie uh, for the nature of the job. But on, on this particular assignment, I, I was ready to interview the individual, but I, I could never locate him. I, I went to his residence at various times of the day. Uh, he lived on the first floor of the, of, the, of the house. Nothing changed. I looked in windows. Nothing changed. So no one was there. So when this, my suspense date came where I had to provide my findings, I told, I told my superior, uh, you know, you better do a check with other agencies because this guy's not around. So I don't know, not much time went by, a week, maybe more, slightly more, but my supervisor, Frank, who was a terrific guy, uh, he told me that case that you were working on, we located the individual we notified FBI. He was arrested as he was getting on a plane in Canada to go to Czechoslovakia. So he had an escape route set up, what to do in the event. And now how, just maybe just being, feeling guilty, not knowing that I was on, on his case. I, I don't know about that part. But they, they had a plan to get him out of the exfiltrate, that's called to exfiltrate him from the country, and we got him before he was able to get out. What became of him, I don't know, but for, uh, for the crime he would be charged with, uh, he would serve some serious time in the penitentiary. So, for example, what was he charged with? Why were you investigating him in the first place? Uh, he was asking for access to classified information uh, because of the job that he was performing. He was some type of engineer. And of course, at that time, we had a lot of firms that were working uh, on army-related uh, information. Was he a civilian or in the oh, he was a civilian. He was a civilian. This is where, you know, we got a chance to be in the civilian community a lot. And now that that part of our job, I hope, is being done by someone other than us. But the way the FBI is overwhelmed, and the fact that army intelligence does not do what I did, uh, that opens up a little weakness. And you can bet that the bad guys will know about the weaknesses in our security system. 
So, uh, you know, I, I even wrote uh, one of my Congress uh, representatives telling them about the importance of counterintelligence. Um, but it's largely uh, FBI's domain, and I, from what I see, and I've been in touch with, with agents through, you know, through the years, um, I would say they're overworked, and it opens up a little weakness in our defense. So you had to cooperate, the U.S. Army had mm -hmm. to cooperate with the FBI, the CIA, local police departments? Yes. Um, yes. How did that work? Was it, was we it had, all the yeah. agencies cooperative? Yes. Uh, as far as I know, Air Force Intelligence was down the hall from us. They're, they're, they did basically the same thing we did. Uh, we knew guys from Naval Intelligence. They did... Those who were, I'm talking about those who were assigned here in the United States. They did what we did, and I think it was very difficult at that time for the bad guys to elude attention from intelligence services. And once you get leads on individuals, you know, what they're doing, how they're performing at their job, that sort of thing, you know, they don't have to be s soldiers. Uh, to be bad guys. There are a lot of civilians who, for whatever reason, want to help a foreign power, and we were there as, as a way to stop that. And I think, I think uh, the cooperation, again, was very good, uh, and I know some of the cases that I worked on uh, were turned over to FBI once I was done, and then the only thing is I didn't know, I, I very rarely saw how they were concluded. Now, whether, because we, we maintain, you know, you, you need to know what you, to do your job. How things worked out, we didn't always know. What kind of a caseload did you carry? Uh, I learned uh, the system, uh, because the Army relied on some type of courier service, and cases wouldn't come all the time, you know, some, once in a while. They would come on a daily basis, but it might be one or two special cases. The bulk of the work would come on on days that you knew when that when when that when those type types of uh, situations would come up. And I I also learned that when I was assigned cases to go and whatever was required. Not not every case was the same, so. The number of people you had to vi visit with in person w would vary. Uh, records check would vary. And then uh, once I learned that routine and I could get as many cases done as quickly as possible, then there was always a break in the assignment. And so you had a chance to recover. But when I worked on a case, I worked very hard, uh, very diligent. And as I say, most of all the people I spoke with were civilians. So we were working in a civilian environment. And at that time, I, except for a rare occasion, uh, they cooperated with us. So you, would you work on one case at a time, bring that to completion and get a new No, case? you couldn't do that. Uh, you didn't have that luxury. So you, you had to become a very good management uh, person as far as your own load of work was uh, and how you're going to do one case at a time or usually that was not the situation. You had to try to do it, set up your schedule so you could do certain things from different cases and not get confused. And then that by the time I left, some of the other special assignments that only one agent would work on. For example, I was uh, uh, an agent assigned to an electronics firm. I'll, I'll mention it to you because some of this has uh, worked into the uh, our media now. And, but I worked. Uh, I was the only Army agent who worked directly with uh, Philco corporation. And what I, I didn't know at the time, but I, some of the case, some of the assignments, the people I talked with were very interesting. And uh, they were working on classified projects. 
I have since found out some of those classified projects. Uh, for example, uh, they were making listening devices uh, that we used even in the jungles of Vietnam. For example, uh, you could be walking along a trail and the sound equipment that we placed could be above ground in a tree and picking up movement of either troops or personnel, whatever the case may be. So we knew all about the so-called Ho Chi Minh trail system. It was not just one trail. What made it difficult for us was that the main trail from North Vietnam getting into the South then broke off into branches and down these separate branches went the, the so-called uh, Viet Cong. The, these were Vietnamese, North Vietnamese soldiers who were not in uniform, which of course is a violation of law, you know, the rules of warfare. Soldiers are supposed to be in uniform. We're seeing the same thing happen today with the war on terrorism. These guys are dressed according to where they are, right? So that's what that's what the Viet Cong were doing. So we did we did have listening devices to pick up traffic, and then once we could identify it from the air or our surveillance satellites, which are fantastic, um, then we call in military operations to wipe those people out coming down the various trail system. So the war, as it turned out, the casualty rate uh, was taking a toll on the enemy, and that's what brought them to the peace table, to talk peace. They, they just couldn't absorb it. Agent, uh, on special assignment to Philco, what was your interaction with Philco? What did you actually have to do? They gave me everything that I asked for. And what, what I was mainly interested in, not, not, not the electronics uh, involved, but the loyalty of the people that were working on the project, because these were highly classified programs. And I, I, I probably don't even know the extent. I know some of wh what they did, you know, how, how it was done. But we had to make sure that the people working on them were not going to provide that information to our opponents. So you would be investigating the people working there? That's right. And they, they had no military service. Except, and I don't know how much they knew. You know, were they, did they know they were working for the army? I, I don't know that. But I, some I had to interview in person, uh, which was interesting. Others, I just relied on the security officer. Doris was her name. Terrific young lady and cooperated, happy to cooperate. And she said, uh, you know, anytime you needed to, to speak with someone, you let me know there'll be no issues. There'll be no problems. And that's what I did. At times I had to speak with the individual uh, for whatever reason. And I never was denied access to them. So removing that capability has brought us to where we are today. I hope it's being covered somehow, but I don't know uh, because the Army had great resources that, you know, that the civilian agencies can't always depend on. How many other agents were working in your office? Uh, uh, that number was classified at one time, uh, but uh, the city of Philadelphia was broken up into sections, like I say, and I think uh, our full capacity was roughly uh, 10 to 12 agents, not counting our supervisors, because some of our supervisors could also perform agent duties. All right, let me mention one special one. That Frank was his name. And uh, he had been in the Army. Uh, he had a brief experience in World War II. And then he was in uh, Korea and he was in Vietnam. And he was uh, our expert polygraph examiner. Uh, and again, we, we were interviewing with people that had to hold the top secret clearance. And in some cases, and I suspect they were going to probably be working for NSA, if not just the Army, and NSA's requirements are a little bit different. So those individuals had to be polygraphed. 
individually, of course. And Frank Naughton was his name. My buddy Frank was, a, was one of the Army's top polygraphers. So I could not be in the same room as the exam was going on, but I, we had a two-way mirror uh, in, in the door that led to where Frank interviewed. And he watched, he let me watch uh, the interview. And you, you can tell just by gestures in the face, because the examiner has to look at the face and, you know, you can record the interview, so that makes it easier. But a lot of times you'll get reaction, human reaction, and he'll know where to probe. But I told him one, and he used to take me on special cases too, where, where no, no polygraph. I, I used to like going with him, even if I didn't really help him that much, but he would take me along on special cases just to get a little more background into what he was doing. And he didn't have to do that. And I, I hated to say no to him, but uh, sometimes I did because my workload was such. But I watched him interview people, and I remember one interview was a young female who was having a very difficult time with her. I don't think they were married yet, but they were going to be. And the guy turned out to be a traitor. And we, we had to talk with her uh, without telling her, you know, what was about to happen. She, she would eventually find out. But uh, the only secure place we we went to her place of business. We had an appointment. Frank took me with with him. He said, "I want you with me." So we interviewed her, and I swear to God, in a vault. The business, the company that she was working for, that was the only secure place. So we went into the vault, and we left a little crack, you know, in the door, so so it could breathe naturally. And he he was like. Uh, uh, if you're a Catholic, uh, you would know the uh, idea of confession, you know, before you go to communion. That's what it reminded me of. He, he, he was like the, uh, a priest at a confessional. He, he put people at ease like you couldn't believe, because she started off by crying. Did and she have any idea why these two strange men are... Well, we told her. Oh. We told her. We told her without, you know, the details of what was going on. But, uh, you know, Did you know anything about this fiance? Uh, no, and I don't think she did. So the one that she must have been. Yeah. Sure. Yes, and you know that type of thing. Uh, and then he came back and he he wanted me to look at you know the report that he typed up, and I said, "No, well, you got all the essentials." Uh, and then, and then I'll mention one other case that uh, Again, I think we do. We did a service too at times because, like, the woman that we I just mentioned, I don't think she knew what the husband was up to. But uh, I was given an assignment where I had to locate someone, and I had no clue uh, where the where the individual was located. So, fortunately, uh, one lead that I pursued very early on. I knew where she worked. So I went to the place of employment. Uh, it was a restaurant, a terrific restaurant in uh, Philadelphia, specializing in seafood. And I went a little early before, you know, before they opened. And uh, she knew I was coming. So the door was locked. They let me in. And uh, she said, we'd like something to eat. And usually we weren't supposed to eat or drink. But I said, yeah, I'll have a little bit of your clam chowder. You don't mind if I eat an interview at the same time? So oh, no. So I went through the interview with her. And then we were always uh, supposed to ask, is there anyone else that you might know who could provide more detailed information? And she said, uh, I think I can give you the name of an estranged wife. I said, I'd be very happy to talk with her. So she didn't have uh, the address or where she was living, but she thought she was still living in Philadelphia. So we had telephone directories in our office. They were, I think they were called reverse directories. They listed every street in Philadelphia. The, the books, I think we had two, they were huge. 
and every address was listed. And the address that I was looking for, I would want to see if there was a phone. And there was. Because otherwise, I would not have known the phone number. It was a restricted number, and uh, uh, I, all I wanted to do was get the address. I was not going to talk with her on the phone. So I went, and this sticks out in my mind as clear as it was the day I went to see her. Uh, I had to first locate, I, 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 I kind of knew the street. Now you were investigating the husband? Yeah. But uh, in this so type the first of... first lady was what, his fiancée or his girlfriend? Or uh, estranged uh, wife. Who was the lady at the restaurant? Oh, the restaurant? No, no content. Oh. I, I, I got the name of the uh, waitress because she knew something about the female that I was interested in, and she gave you know gave me detailed information on that. So uh, uh, I was looking for names on mailboxes, you know that sort of thing, and uh, I got lucky. I, I, I went to a couple houses. I I talked. I knocked on a couple doors, and uh, and then one lady that I spoke with knew the individual I was looking for. So I went unannounced. She did not know I was coming. And this would be a very important interview. And as soon as I introduced myself and I showed her my badge and credentials and she started sobbing. She knew, you know, why I was there. And I said, let's, let's go inside. I said, let's not stand out here. So I put her at ease as much as I could. And she, she sobbed through the whole interview. So I got some key things that, I, you know, I wanted to check on again. So I, I spoke with her for, you know, probably about an hour, and I told her, uh, I want to I come back tomorrow, go over some things with you, and I'm going to bring uh, one of my agent friends with me. He was the only black agent we had in Melbourne. He was like 6'2", 200 pounds. And I said, well, what I'm also going to do, uh, although your husband is not going anywhere, I said, unless he should escape somehow, he does not know this investigation is going on. We're watching him in basic training. I said, so please feel secure. I said, if we get any information, we will have people on your doorstep like that. I said, but what I am going to do, I'm going to call the police department, and you're going to see that a patrol car will be in your neighborhood on a regular basis until we feel the situation is under control. And she smiled. So the next day I went back with my friend Melvin and uh, she was happy to see him. <laughs> and again, I took uh, all the details down and then uh, prepared a written report statement. And I came back uh, for her to sign the statement and told her what we were going to do next. Now, the only thing is I don't know how the story ended up. What were you investigating her husband for? Uh, probably being in the country uh, illegally, uh, trying to attempt to penetrate the U.S. Army for its uh, weapons uh, education. Uh, he, he was a bad apple. Now, what, what he was planning to do once he became proficient in more than one weapon, I don't know, but uh, I don't think it was anything good. Uh, it, it wasn't going to happen at basic training because there you're limited to the M16, which you only have in your possession when you're being tested at the rifle range. Uh, if you had any access to a handgun, I doubt it. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't do any firing with a, a handgun until I actually was at agent's training, so I doubt he would have had that. Plus, once, once he was being watched, it was a matter of time before, you know, they said, you know, the gig is up. We know what your, your true background is, you know, and then what happened Did after that. Did you know any of this stuff about it? Uh, some of it, but I don't know about the, the phony name and, you know, the details. See, I, I don't think so, and I don't recall, you know, from that interview, uh, 
uh, any indication that she knew some of the details. What an interesting job, though. Yes, and as I say, because we were working in the civilian environment, uh, I, I would think, even today, it would be a great asset to still have. I know there is an army intelligence, but I don't. I know for a fact that they do not have the counterintelligence capability that we had. So that is missing, and I think. Again, knowing the nature of our job as I knew it could help today. So tell me what a typical day would be like for you. Did you have like office hours, like a nine to five? Um, no. The only day I had to be there was every Monday morning for what was called agent's call, where they would check to see if we were all right, uh, how everything was going. And they were interested in you know how we were doing. Any, any problems they could help us with. Uh, and then uh, the commanding officer, who was a lieutenant colonel, sometimes would address us on developments, you know, things that we needed to know that were about to happen. Um, for example, he, sometimes we would have special assignments where he actually would, have, would ask if somebody would like to spare some of their daily time and help out. And when I could, I, I did. And he got to know me because he had been a history major. Uh, I, he was working on his master's degree, but I don't think he had. But he had a bachelor's degree. He was a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he had been in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Wealth of knowledge. And, and when he asked me to help him on things, you know, I, I hated to say no, and I, I seldom did because I had the utmost respect for him. And I remember he took me one time on an assignment where uh, I was, my only assignment was to guard the room in which all, the, all these important people, FBI, CIA, Army, Navy, Air Force Intelligence. It was a big thing. I, I don't know what it was about. But I sat outside the door. I could pick up little things I could hear. But that's one thing, you know, I didn't ask him any questions. If he volunteered stuff. And uh, he all he told me was uh, they, were, they were interested in some activity here in the United States. And they were worried about a, a large terrorist type incident. But uh, I don't think it happened because there there were incidents that happened even in Philadelphia, but uh, you know they were pretty easy to investigate. What was Lieutenant Colonel's name? Uh, I wouldn't want you to use it. Oh, then don't tell me. Okay, that. good. Because um, he may, you know, he had children who. So Monday mornings you'd have to be at the office right. for the agents' call. Other than yeah. that, you. On our own. As you please. Right. And the great thing about it, uh, once you became an experienced agent, you knew how to manage your time. Right. And I'll mention this to you every, and one, one of these moments was very special. But Mondays, uh, once we met with each other, we, during the spring and summer, we tried to play golf once a week in the afternoon. And we would try to clear our schedule, so we would go to uh, this country club in uh, where I, in, near where I lived, Walnut Hill Country Club, no longer their condo project now. But we would play threesome or foursome, you know, together. And we'd play for, I think we had to play, pay for the, the clubs, you know, and renting the clubs. But on one day I went early, and uh, at the first tee, I would wait for the other guys to come. At the first tee were three of the Philadelphia 76ers players. <laughs> in that, in the, in, at that time, it was guys like Luke Jackson, uh, Wally Jones, and Hal Greer, if you know anything about the NBA. They, they were all stars, and they had, they had a pretty good team. So I went over. I, I introduced myself. I didn't, I didn't tell them anything when I was. I said, you guys got a day off. You say, yeah, we're looking for 
somebody to complete a foursome. You want to play with us? And I said, fellas, it'd be an honor, but I can't. I'm waiting for two or three of my buddies. I got I to gotta wait with them. I might have told them that I was in the Army. I, I don't know. But we, we talked, and uh, uh, I said, uh, you know, this would have been a great experience to go around with you. <laughs> but I said, I, I can't do it. But we used to go, like I say, once a week. We'd pick out a day when it was convenient for everybody. And then the, re the rest of the day would, you know, if we had something to do, we'd save it for tomorrow. Did you travel at all as part of your job, or were you strictly confined to Philadelphia? Uh, there were special assignments uh, uh, that we had. Uh, and again, you, usually it was a volunteer uh, type thing. But again, if, if the colonel told me something, uh, then, you know, I, I, I would always try to, to answer his request. And on one of them, uh, he sent me to be part of a practice exercise, uh, training new agents. And, of course, the, 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 new, the guys that we were going to follow around did not know all the details of what we were going to do. But uh, it was interesting because they treated us like hostile uh, agents, you know, in a foreign country. That, and we followed them around for, uh, I think the exercise started like on a, a Friday, or no, maybe, I think it was during the week. It was like a Thursday morning, and it ended like on a Saturday afternoon. And we had to follow them wherever they went, constant surveillance. At night, uh, we stayed in motel rooms. Uh, the first night we got from the front desk where, the, where this group was going to be staying, we bugged the hotel room. And I'm honest to God, that's the only time I ever was on that type of assignment. And we were, the bug itself, you, you would never realize, you know, how the technology then, it's even better now. But it looked like a pin, you know, about that long and just very skinny. And it had, you know, a transmitter somewhere in the body of it. And we sewed it into the uh, curtains, you know, above. So you could, you had, we actually got on a chair to do it. So even if they opened the curtain, I, you so know. you bugged one room? One room where, where they were staying. They all were staying in the same room? That's right. Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Who slept on the floor? I don't know. But anyway, we listened to, you know, their game plan. So it was easier. It was easier. Were the new agents that were getting trained? No, these were experienced guys. Oh. So they, you know, they to 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 pull this off on them. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you how it went. We we knew where they were going. So even when they tried to speed up, you know, we broke all kinds of motor vehicle laws just to stay with them. We tried running them off the road, or they tried running us off the road. It got a little touch and touchy at times. But uh, uh, every night, nothing happened at night. So they weren't going to pull any stuff at night. That was bedtime. So that, that was good. So one, way, one thing we noticed, uh, they, were, they were visiting places that they knew in advance that they were going to visit. And one guy was constantly uh, reaching into his pocket. And we couldn't see what he was taking out, but it turned out to be a camera. So I had the thought that that might be what they were doing, taking pictures of facilities. So when that occasion came up, I, I would bump into them, uh, you know, to sort of blur the, blur the photography. And it was interesting to, uh, because we, we could see what our agents could do in a hostile environment. Uh, and the interesting thing was, if you go uh, in the capacity and you identify yourself to the foreign country and they know who you are, yes, they have the right to follow you, but this was like a gentleman's agreement. Not, not behind the Iron Curtain, but to other countries and so forth. Behind the Iron Curtain is going to be a little bit different, but we had people that operated in the Soviet Union too. Uh, 
But at the end of the exercise, we all met together. We ate, we had drank some beer. And I asked one of the guys, I said, uh, you know, why did you have your hand in your pocket a, a lot? And, and he pulled out this little notepad and he w had a little pencil or pen that he was writing observations on. He said, I was, I was taking, I was taking notes down on important things that we wanted to make sure we knew about. So we had a nice visit with them. And then I said, uh, where, where, can you tell us where you're heading next? And he said, uh, we're going behind the Iron Curtain. He didn't sp say specifically, but I think they're going to the Soviet Union. And here, again, we had, they would be called legal spies, where we have a, a, an unwritten agreement that our people can go in and check on military facilities to see that they're doing what they promised to be doing, you know, under whatever statutes there are in international law. And I said, geez, I, I wish you guys the best of luck. He said, well, he said, you guys were very efficient because that's, that's how did we're going to... Did you tell them how you bugged their room? We did. So they were aware of that when they get over to where yeah, they're going? That's right. Exactly. And, uh, and now today, the way the technology is, uh, you don't have to have... And we, we probably had some of this at the, t at the time when I was serving. But you, you can listen in on conversations without having a device in the room. Uh, and again, the, the photography, for example, the, uh, from the days of the U-2. Uh, I, I've had a chance, you know, I'm a member of uh, the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. It's mostly CIA people. But our military uh, similar type group organization is not as good as uh, AFIO, we call it. I've been to all of our major intelligence uh, facilities. Been to CIA a number of times, uh, NSA a few times. And the thing, the thing that is amazing is the, uh, the caliber of people that we get, but they all have to have clearance. And the, the abilities that we have electronically now are, are amazing. Um, that's why no conversation, no message on a computer is safe. You have to find ways of communicating. And some of the old ways, person to person, for example, still work today. Uh, the so-called dead drop, where you're working with a uh, an, uh, an individual from a foreign country who is betraying his country or her country because intelligence officers are male and female more so now than ever before. And uh, uh, what, what they do uh, when the Soviet agent has information, there's a way of setting up where our people go to retrieve it where Face-to-face -face contact is not necessary, and so we'll, with this, you, you'll, it's called servicing a dead drop, where you'll go to a certain location. Nobody's going to be around except you. You retrieve it from its hiding place, and get out of there. And now we have men and women in denied areas as we speak, doing that job, because some things can't be done on a computer. And if that's all, it's always going to be that way. So there's a need for what we call human, H-U-M-I-N-T, human intelligence. You have to have flesh and blood people working in these dangerous assignments. Because when, when those, if you're an illegal, which, you know, our hidden people are, if you're caught in some countries, you know, you can be put to death, and, and you know it. Uh, what alleviates the problem there a little bit, this is when we make trades. So a lot of times uh, you might see on, on, t on the TV news that uh, so-and-so came out of the Soviet Union. Uh, that could be very accurate, what they might not mention, 
is that we sent a Soviet back because we feel we we owe it to our people. If we have a chance to save their life, yes, we're going to do it because enough die, you know, on the job as it is. But if we can do something to avert that, yes. So it's not a bun. You know, a lot of times you hear all the negative stuff that occurs within the intelligence community. It comes from the Edward Snowdens of the world, who for whatever reason, you know, want to betray the country. But the other, you know, we've always had traitors. You go back to Benedict Arnold. This was your life for the three years? Philadelphia. Yep. Now you said you rented your own apartment. Did you mm -hmm. always live by yourself? I preferred to. Uh, at when I first started, uh, I had a. Uh, I was going to take over an agent's duties, so I lived with him. And after that, I, you know, you, you do get compensation for most of your rent. So I said, "Is there any rule of, about me being on my own?" I said, "I prefer living on my own." No problem. They can come and inspect, you know, your residence, but that never happened. They were, again, they were more interested in the in the finished product, and I kept them off my back. I was efficient. I did an excellent job, and they didn't have to bother with me. Could you communicate with your family? Yeah, I came there home. No restrictions. Oh well, I couldn't tell them what I was doing, but they knew. You know, once once I finished basic training, and then the intelligence school, uh, I don't think I I don't think I missed a Christmas, uh, e even from basic training. So I was in I, I was I was home for three Christmases. I might have missed Thanksgiving, you know, here and there. But if there was some, what I usually did, because you you could save up, you got so many days that you could. I think it was like fifteen days where you didn't have, have to have any reason to uh, be in the office. You could, you could take leave and, and go for a week at a time if you wanted. And what I did, I, since I could go home if I had to go home without taking a leave. So at the end, I saved up uh, out of the, oh, gee, I think I think I, I had like 40-some-odd days saved up, and I got paid for that. At my my rate at that time, of being E five, I got so much per month. I I got to, I got paid uh, for the leave time that I didn't use, which I thought was great. Did you go home on weekends occasionally? Once in a while, but usually just holidays. And then if I felt uh, the the longest I went was for a week, when I would take a week off, you know, just to just to get away. And, but most of the time it was a weekend. And, and again, knowing our schedule, uh, the weekend usually I would try to leave on a, a Friday. You know, get all my work done so I could leave like on a Friday afternoon. I rode the train. If it was a big deal, I, I think I might have flown home one time, the whole time. But we, I'll tell you one interesting story since we travel all the time in civilian clothes. Uh, we had our office prepare a letter, if necessary, to show to, to a train personnel, usually the when you bought your ticket or the conductor. Uh, but since I was, I could just show the letter, I didn't need, even need a ticket, so sometimes I didn't even get a ticket. I just sat down. So at one time I was sitting down with a lady who I was, I think I may have been heading back home. I could have been returning, but I think I was heading back home because she was from Philadelphia, elderly lady. And the uh, conductor came around, won, won my ticket. And uh, I said, I don't have one. He said, well, I showed him the letter that we had prepared. He read that. And he said, this doesn't mean anything, which he's, he was right. He was, he was strict doing his job. So I said, you, you'll have to get off at the next stop. I said, okay, fine. So the train stops. I'm in North Philadelphia station. That was the first stop. But uh, 
I told the Sicilian lady next to me, I said, please hold my seat, I'll be back. So I go and I wait till everybody, nobody's around, just me and him. And I said, sir, I said, uh, I'm not getting off this train. And I showed him my bathroom credentials. I said, you idiot, you came close to blowing my cover. I'm, I'm in a special assignment. I said, take a close look at, at that credential. You know, you could see his expression changed quickly. He said, okay, go, go back to your seat. I said, thank you. <laughs> the only time I ran into trouble. But, you know, the guy was doing his job. <laughs> what did you do for entertainment in your downtime when you were not doing uh, Besides golf? Uh, Philadelphia was home of major league sports. You could see NFL football. You could see NBA basketball. But I spent uh, more time uh, seeing the Phillies play baseball. And at that time, that was in North Philadelphia at a place called Connie Mack Stadium. And again, we had free passes to get into sporting events. And it was never questioned. They, they never, even though we weren't in uniform. So I saw, I saw the Sixers play, I saw the Phillies play, and I saw some college basketball as well. What is your opinion of the officers, your supervisors? Uh, the ones that I dealt with, again, they're not your usual army officer. Uh, they were all well-educated and a tremendous experience in the work that they had done. They were all veterans in, in what I was learning to do. So I was not afraid to ask them questions no matter what it was. And the cooperation was fantastic. You would never know that, you know, I, I could be talking to you. I talked to them in the same capacity. I didn't have to say, sir, and all that stuff. Although at times, you know, I showed respect. I respected their rank, and uh, uh, it was it was a, that type of teamwork, you know, in, in that type of situation is important. And I'd say we, we had a uh, an award winning team, uh, and even the even the secretaries, the females civilians that worked with us, terrific people, never question anything. And like I say, no matter how busy they were, they found. Time. They would apologize sometimes. They said, well, I can't be as quick as I normally might be. And I, like I said, I rarely ask them to type, but sometimes I had to. And the work they did was efficient. I think they enjoyed being with us, really. What about the fellow, your fellow agents? Did you all become friends? Uh, again, uh, we would have been great friends. Uh, we had a lot in common, uh, but we were so busy that we had to make time to visit with one another. And one thing was golf. Uh, we tried to go to lunch once a week, and, and pretty much. And we, we, we enjoyed that. Did they in touch with any of them? Uh, not really. Uh, there was one that I contacted at one time. But, you know, once you get out of that environment, and, and you're a civilian, then 100%. No. No. Have you had any reunions or anything like that? Uh, the only reunion I go to is with mostly CIA officers. <laughs> uh, I have met from time to time uh, some military intelligence, you know, in the group that I'm with. Uh, it's called AFIO, Association of Former Intelligence Officers. I might have my membership card. But again, that, that experience is different because we didn't do the exact same thing. We were... Uh, when you got out of the Army, did you stay in the intelligence? Uh, no, but what I did do, uh, it helped me do research because I knew where to look. So, uh, for example, there was a program I saw uh, on the uh, Rosenberg case. So I said, see, I'm going to, I'm going to look into that. I want to see what the army has on it. And then at the same time, 
this was very early in the Freedom of Information Act. So what I was doing, I, I asked the Army if I could look at their classified files. And I'm not an agent now, right? But they knew I had been. I said, come on down. So I went to, uh, I think it was Aberdeen Proving Grounds, uh, where, where they had held the files at that time. And uh, what, I was, what, I, what I requested was uh, any information on, on the Rosenbergs. And uh, I thought that because the Army cooperated with FBI, I was pretty sure I would see the FBI files, which I was not supposed to see. So the first file I opened up, there was the FBI investigation on the Rosenbergs and others that I, I didn't know about. And I didn't say anything. And I had permission to take notes. So on the last day I was there, I used most of the time to memorize as much as I could, because I wanted to remember the names especially. And then I called in my uh, supervisor, who was a, I think it was a full colonel. And I, I told him, you know, I took, I, I saw some information that I probably should not have taken notes on. He said, okay, well, fine, this is what you want to do. He said, uh, he, said he said, he asked me, what, what did it consist of? I said, mostly FBI materials. He said, yeah, you shouldn't, shouldn't take notes on that. So he said, look at your, look over the notes, he said, point out certain things for me. And, and then give, them, give everything to me. Your notes are going to have to stay here. He said, we're going to treat it like a classified document. So I actually produced a secret document. Some of the material was still top secret, but most of it, the Army's classification for secret, that's very important because in the Army, top secret information is information that if made public can result in war. So you see very little top secret information. But a lot of the secret information in other agencies is, is like top secret information. And I was more interested in the names of people that I hadn't run across, because the spy ring was bigger than what we knew at that time. So I, re I memorized as much as I could, and I gave it over to the colonel, who was very considerate. He said, I'll, you know, I'll try to speed it up if I can. He said, but, you know, you're, you're going to have to, you'll hear from the FBI. So I, several months went by, and I got a call, phone call at home, and it was the FBI from Washington, D.C., and he said, Mr. Patton, he said, remember the notes that you took? I said, yeah. I said, when am I going to get them? He said, you, you've created a major problem for us. And I, I knew, I knew what. So I was very cooperative with him. He said, it's going to take us a while to go through because the information you got was, was classified, highly classified, especially the, you know, the manufacturing of the bomb. And all. You know, I said, I, I can't make a, an atomic bomb. I said, you're not worried about that. He said, no. He said, but the people who were involved in it, they might not be too happy that you know who they were. I said, okay, fine. I said, take your time. So... I'd say about four months went by, and they mailed me, you know, what did they you did. Did you get your notes back? Got my, oh, yeah. And it was, re, it was all kinds of things were crossed out, you know, that I couldn't, I couldn't read. So what I did where I could, I remembered, you know, certain names. So but once you get names, then you can ask the FBI, I'd like to see a file if you have on this person. Right. So even even though I shouldn't have gotten that name, under the Freedom of, Informa Freedom of Information Act, they're required to look through it. Now what they've done, they've declassified so much. All right, I was what I did really can't be done anymore, because they now have an FOI, Freedom of Information Act, reading room, right. Then they went, they eliminated that. I, I used that facility. I did that with CIA as well. Uh, but now you request documents from a, from a list, and it takes forever. But they'll Xerox 
the material and send it to a competent researcher. So I'd be all that. And to do research today, I, I wouldn't really want to do it because of what I just described. But here's my only organization that I'm a member of. But it's through them that I've been to every major intelligence agency in the United States of America. Wow. I've been to some that, uh, I'll, I'll mention one to you that, that you can uh, mention, but don't go, don't go into details. But I was, I was, you had to have. Don't say anything on camera. You don't want the world to know. Oh, okay. Well, all right. I'll, I'll be. Yeah. No, I'll, 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 I'll just mention it in a, you know, sanitized way. But I, I was at a Air Force base uh, that is closed, a closed base, and there are very, very few places that I've been where you're met at the gate. Uh, with a, a warning sign, use of deadly force authorized. So they could shoot you dead without any question. That's how highly classified it was. So while we were there, uh, this was very early on uh, when some of these programs were still on the drawing boards, but we, I saw... Uh, uh, some of the aircraft that we're using now. Uh, that this can, is after the war or back when you this were... Is, this is just a few years ago. Oh, oh. This is when I'm a civilian, but a member of AFIO. Uh, but at this particular Air Force base, uh, we saw what, what the media calls drones. Uh, their technical name is UAV, Unmanned Aerial Vehicle. And these planes don't need anybody aboard. They're flown by a pilot who's sitting behind a computer console navigating the plane. And one, one thing that we learned, uh, they showed us uh, classified photography that's taken. Uh, I can describe uh, what I saw to you but the actual looking at the picture is classified because it's, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, from 12 miles high, if somebody's walking in a compound, I'll use the example of Bin Laden. If Bin Laden's walking in his compound where he eventually was, where we found him and killed him, uh, if he was reading the Koran, we could read the Quran from over his shoulder from 13 miles high. So the question I had in my mind uh, that I did not put to any official, I said, if that was true, then why didn't we try to assassinate him on one of his daily walks? Because fire a predator missile, all it's got to do is get close to him. He's gone. So that leads me to my analysis of the of the uh, the raid where he eventually was killed. Uh, I think it got to the point where uh, the the mission the mission changed and maybe very late. I think initially the, uh, President Obama uh, was sending in a team to capture him or tried to capture him. But again, you never know in detail what's awaiting you. So we knew he probably would be guarded. But we, we of course, have the capability of the people that we're sending in can take out the important people and, or some of the people and capture bin Laden. But that, I think, became uh, unworkable. So rather than capture him alive, that, that final raid that went in to, and killed him was the only option. And, you know, we could, and, and we got rid of the body. We did not keep the body. I hear rumors. Uh, we gave him proper burial rights under his religion, and the remains were dumped at sea. But an operation to try to capture him would have been considered.
and for whatever, whatever reason. Only commander-in-chief can do this. Only the President of the United States said no. Nobody, nobody has the right to go ahead once the President says no. Do you recall your last day in service? Yes, I do. Can you describe that for me? Yeah, I, I was uh, all packed uh, from my apartment in Germantown, Pennsylvania. Uh, I had a car all packed from, with all my civilian belongings and again, some of the things that the Army allowed me to keep. And uh, I left at probably about nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was planning on driving directly home and I got home in the early afternoon and my Sicilian grandmother was at the residence to welcome me home. She was the first one <laughs> to welcome me home. My mother, of course, was working at that time. And uh, as soon as she came home, of course, she had to bake a cake. She had to invite our close relatives over. And that was, again, one of the happiest moments in my life. I survived, and I also served my country. What did you do in the first days and weeks after you got out? Uh, I took a few days where I did nothing at all. I just uh, met with friends who I knew. And then my plan was to uh, visit with the superintendent of schools and begin my teaching career. So this was, I think, uh, I got out in October, first part of October, and I probably went to see him, you know, like the third week in October. School, school had started. And I told him, you know, as soon as uh, anything becomes available, I want to begin my teaching career. He said, are you willing to substitute? I said, absolutely. So I started substituting. And then, I don't know, maybe the third Substitute assignments. So assignment. I started going in for the same guy on a daily basis, and I got a call from a superintendent. He said, "Come and visit with me." He, he told me that the individual I was subbing for is not returning. He's going to take an early retirement. Had some health issues. He said, "But I, I can't start you at the high school right away. You're going to start at the middle school, teaching U.S. history." And he said, because of your service, I'm going to start you. I think I think I got three three years advancement on the pay scale. He didn't have to do that, but he did. I said, thank it's you. Torrington? Torrington, right. And how long did you teach there? Uh, I had 30 years uh, service. And then I for my retirement benefits, I could add on three years of my army time. So for my pen, my pension was affected because I got three years that I was not in the classroom. And of course the army gave me money when I left too. Jim, did your military experience influence your thinking about war? Yes, I'm, I'm anti-war. But I'm not a pacifist. Uh, at any time, if I had been asked to uh, defend myself, I would want whatever the best weapon was available to defend myself. So, uh, although, again, I think we demand a lot from our soldiers, I think, although there are problems with the volunteer service, but at least you know what you're getting, and for the most part, they know what they're in for. So in that manner, uh, that's good. But getting people like me, I don't know. You know, with a with a master's degree, are you going are you going to be willing to serve in the military? I don't I don't know. So you'd have to ask that question of contemporaries today. Uh, you know, military personnel first. You know, what brought them in? And then, I'm sure there's a big group, I don't know how you would identify them, who are happy not to serve in the military. So without the draft, I, I'm not sure, I, I hope we're meeting our security needs, but we may not be. 
So we'll, see, we'll have to see how this war on terrorism plays out. How would you say your service affected your life? Uh, gave me a uh, gave me a sense of discipline, because you know leaving uh, Central Connecticut State at the time I did, uh, drugs were becoming uh, prevalent on campus, uh, disrespect for people in authority was somewhat common. Uh, my military experience told me that's not the way to be a man. Um, you have to show respect to your superiors, but in a, in a free country, we, we have the op opportunity to disagree and, you know, try to win the argument rather than do something that is not appropriate. I'd like to thank you for sharing your story and thank you for your service to our country. Thanks for having me and thank you for uh, spending time and I, I'm looking forward to this project uh, getting some attention.